der Völkerstreit oder Hass untereinander. Er wird gepflegt von ganz bestimmten Interessenten. Es ist eine kleine, wurzellose, internationale Clique, die die Völker gegeneinander hetzt, die nicht will, dass sie zur Ruhe kommen. Es sind das die Menschen, die überall und nirgends zu Hause sind, die nirgends einen Boden haben, auf dem sie gewachsen sind, sondern die heute in Berlin leben, morgen genauso gut in Brüssel sein können, übermorgen in Paris oder mit in Prag oder in Wien oder in London und die sich überall zu Hause fühlen. <lacht> لقد آن أوان قتالكم لقد آن أوان قتلكم وإنا بإذن الله لها نحن والمسلمين الصادقين المخلصين This map represents territorial dispute zones around the world. China, for example, occupies Tibet. Turkey has seized part of the island of Cyprus. Morocco and Mauritania claim part of the Sahara. Yet it is rare to hear about these conflicts while the dispute between Israel and the Arabs of Palestine regularly makes the headlines, leads to systematic condemnations at the United Nations and demonstrations calling for a boycott of the Jewish state. From terrorist attacks to retaliation, people are suffering and it seems that this conflict has no end, while many in the Western world support the Palestinian cause, a cause that has even become a fashion with its specific vocabulary, clothing, and rituals. However, the Palestinian cause is of much less interest when, for example, the Palestinian city of Yarmouk in Syria is attacked and bombarded by the Assad regime. <laughs> Nor did anyone rally for the Palestinian victims when, in 1970, the Jordanian and Syrian armies carried out a massacre, resulting in the death of 25,000 people, according to the PLO. When Arabs attack Arabs, the streets of Western cities remain empty. Could it be that the Palestinian cause is able to federate in only one case when Jews are involved? Would it then be possible that the media, the United Nations, and activists are more anti-Israel than they are pro-Palestinian? Without knowledge of the region's history, and as a result of billions being spent by Arabs in propaganda, it becomes easy to accept their version, according to which Jews invaded and stole a country called Palestine. However, some PLO leaders, such as Zuhair Mohsen, never hesitated to express their knowledge of the facts. The Palestinian people do not exist. The creation of a Palestinian state is only one way to continue our struggle against the state of Israel for Arab unity. In reality, there is no difference between Jordanians, Palestinians, Syrians, and Lebanese. <laughs> وجذورهم مصرية جذورهم مصرية مصرية قد يكون من الإسكندرية من القاهرة من ضميات من الوجه البحري من أصوان من 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 الصعيد نحن مصريون نحن عرب نحن مسلمون نحن منكم. In the middle of the 19th century, on his return from a long stay in the Palestinian region, a certain Karl Marx published the following article in the New York Herald Tribune. The sedentary population of Jerusalem numbers about 15,500 souls, of whom 4,000 are Muslims and 8,000 are Jews. The Muslims, forming about the fourth part of the whole, are, of course, the masters in every aspect. 
Nothing equals the misery and the suffering of the Jews in Jerusalem. They are the constant objects of Muslim oppression and intolerance. At the same time, Mark Twain wrote, There was hardly a tree or a shrub anywhere, even the olive and the cactus, those fast friends of a worthless soil, had almost deserted the country. And where does this myth of a stolen land come from? In 1947, the United Nations shared what remained of mandatory Palestine. The Jews accepted this. The Arabs refused and attacked Israel, hoping to push the Jews into the sea or exterminate them. No one expected Israel to win the war. In 1967 and 1973, the Arab countries tried again to destroy the Jewish state. Despite their numerical superiority, the Arabs lost war after war. Their military defeats led them to adopt a new strategy. Use diplomacy and oil pressure to bring Israel to an end. For a land conquered by Islam must forever belong to Islam. Islam, according to its own view, came to the world to replace Judaism and Christianity, not to live side by side with them, because Islam, according to its own terminology, it's Din al-Haq, means religion of truth, while, while Judaism and Christianity are Din al-Ba'atil, religion of falsehood. Islam from the beginning was under the doubt whether it is an original religion or it is a, a, a copy, copy and paste of Judaism and Christianity. According to Islam, a Jew has the right to live as the The mere existence of Israel, and especially the rule over Jerusalem, and what we're doing in the Temple Mount, for them it means that Judaism comes back to life, and this is a threat on the mere existence, on the raison d'etre of Islam. حتى يقاتل المسلمون اليهود حتى يختبئ اليهودي خلف الشجر والحجر فينطق الشجر والحجر يقول يا مسلم يا عبد الله هذا يهودي ورائي تعال فاقتله اللهم عجل بيوم يهود يا الله اللهم عجل بيوم قتلهم اللهم عجل بيوم قتالهم اللهم عجل بيوم ذبحهم In 1929, an Egyptian fundamentalist imam, Hassan al-Banna, founded the Muslim Brotherhood, now recognized as a terrorist organization. Its purpose? To fight against the secular influence of England and the West. Very quickly, al-Banna became friends with Hajj Amine al-Husseini, the great Mufti of Jerusalem, who was already responsible for the murderous riots of 1920, whose religious hatred for the Jews he shared. Hitler's speeches convinced al-Husseini that the Nazis would be ideal allies against the English occupation and world Judaism that he dreamt of annihilating. In 1933, al-Husseini established contact with the German consul in Jerusalem. 
That same year, in Syria, Antun Saada, nicknamed the Syrian Führer, created his Nationalist Socialist Party, Hizb el el Qaumi el Suri, whose flag strangely resembles the Nazi banner. In Egypt, Ahmad Hussein founded the Young Egypt Party, Misr al Fatah, whose slogan was One People, One Party, One Leader. Identical to that of the Nazi party, the infamous Ein Volk, Ein Reich, Ein Führer. Behind these alliances could be found each time the great Mufti. In 1938, Alfred Rosenberg, an ideologue of the Nazi party, wrote, the longer the blaze continues in Palestine, the stronger the opposition to a Jewish state in all Muslim countries. According to German archives seized by the Allies in Flensburg, it was with Nazi money that al Husseini launched an Arab revolt in 1936, which led to the massacre of hundreds of Jews, particularly in Hebron. The pretext for these massacres? The Jews were reportedly preparing to destroy the Al-Aqsa Mosque, a lie that has since been regularly repeated by Arafat and Mahmoud Abbas. In 1938, when the rise of Nazism made Jewish immigration to Palestine more urgent than ever, the publication of the English White Paper would open Palestine's doors wide to Arab immigrants, while blocking the arrival of Jews in despair of escaping Nazi persecution. As the war raged and spread around the world, Haj Amin fled to Iraq, where he participated in a coup with Rashid Ali al Khalani, a Nazi at heart just like him. Together, they unleashed the Farhud, an organized massacre of Iraqi Jews. After many exchanges with the top Nazi leaders, including Heinrich Himmler, who became a close friend, it was in 1941 that the Grand Mufti finally met Adolf Hitler. The precise condition for our collaboration with Germany was complete freedom to eliminate the Jews to the last from Palestine and the Arab world. I asked Hitler for his explicit agreement to allow us to solve the Jewish problem. The answer I received was, the Jews are yours. The Nazis granted him a luxurious villa on Klopstock Street, which housed a Jewish school until its confiscation in 1939 as well as a comfortable pension, which he would receive until the end of the war. In return, he was responsible for radio propaganda in Arabic, espionage in the Middle East, and the organization of Muslims into military units. This division of Bosnian Muslims, established with the help of Greater Germany, is a model for Muslims in all countries. Nazi Germany is fighting world Jewry. The Quran says, you will see that the Jews are your worst enemies. In 1942, Eichmann informed the Mufti of the methods that had been put in place for the final solution 
that is, the extermination of the Jews. Es gehört zu den Dingen, die man leicht ausspricht. Das jüdische Volk wird ausgerottet. Es hat Ihnen jede Partei genossen. Ganz klar steht in unserem Programm drin, Ausschaltung der Juden, Ausrottung machen wir ha, Kleinigkeit. Very impressed. The Mufti asked for an advisor to help him implement the same methods in Palestine, once the Nazis had won the war. His plan was to create giant crematoria near Nablus, like those in Auschwitz, to exterminate Jews from all Arab Muslim countries. When in 1943, Eichmann planned to exchange German prisoners of war for 5,000 Jewish children and send them to Palestine with the agreement of the English government. Husseini protested and finally had the children exterminated in gas chambers. In 1944, as Germany had almost lost the war, the Mufti convinced the Nazis to organize the massive poisoning of the Jews in Palestine. A commando parachuted south of Jericho, but it was reported to British forces by the Bedouins and its leader, Kurt Wieland, arrested. After Germany's defeat, the Mufti was imprisoned in France then quickly freed, thanks to the intervention of his longtime friend, Hassan al-Banna. His anti-Semitic influence did not end with the Allies' victory. The Mufti found refuge in Egypt, where he was welcomed as a national hero, while the Arab League put pressure on the West so that he would not be tried for war crimes. In 1948, and until his death, he continued to campaign against Israel and to call for the extermination of Jews. Among his relatives was his nephew, Mohammed Abdel Rauf Arafat al Qudwa al Husseini, an Egyptian born in Cairo who soon became famous under his war name, Yasser Arafat. The anti-Semitic virus was already widespread in the Muslim world, but the phenomenon intensified with the massive conversion of former Nazis to Islam and the refuge of several high-ranking Nazi dignitaries in Arab countries, particularly in Syria and Egypt. Nazi officers trained the Fedayeen to become terrorists, Goebbels' propaganda methods were widely employed. But the world changed after the war, and a new totalitarianism, just as deadly as Nazism, was rapidly spreading. Like Nazism, Soviet communism needed the support of Arab Muslim countries. After having supported the partition of Palestine, Stalin realized that Israel would never become another satellite of the Soviet Empire, and he turned against the Jews. the idea of a Palestinian people, rejected until then, had just been born in the minds of Yasser Arafat and the Egyptian president Abdel Gamal Nasser, with the help of the Russian KGB. Its objective was not to offer independence and prosperity to a people, but to turn world opinion against Israel. It took time. But it worked. Nineteen seventy-six, 
a former Nazi, Kurt Waldheim, was then Secretary General of the United Nations. Under his leadership, under pressure from the Muslim world and from communist countries, the General Assembly passed Resolution 3379, declaring Zionism as a form of racism. A great evil has been loosed upon the world. Now I should wish to be understood, wish it to be understood, that I am here making one point and one point only, which is whatever else Zionism may be, it is not and cannot be a form of racism. It was a temporary victory for the Palestinians, now supported by two camps the nostalgic of Nazi Germany and the far left. Definitely, most definitely, we oppose a Jewish state in any part of Palestine. Resolution 3379 was cancelled in 1991. Recently, Mahmoud Abbas, whose anti-Semitism and double talk are well known, has tried to restore this old resolution. Throughout the world, the Palestinian cause has become the symbol of a people oppressed by Jews. But it was Goebbels who said, if you tell a lie big enough and keep repeating it, people will eventually come to believe it. The satanic Jews, they control everything and mostly everybody. 